It is the true believer's ability to shut his eyes and stop his ears to facts that do not deserve to be either seen or heard, which is the source of his unequaled fortitude and constancy. He cannot be frightened by danger, nor disheartened by obstacle, nor baffled by contradictions, because he denies their existence. Eric Hoffer, The True Believer. Welcome back. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes' masterpiece. We have arrived at the last chapters of part two of Don Quixote. Any serious student of the early modern novel or the history of the novel form generally must account for the final passages of Cervantes' masterpiece. At the end of part one, Cervantes used the condensed chivalric adventure of the Night of the Lake, the story of Eugenio, Anselmo, Leandra, and Vicente, Don Quixote's encounter with the penitents carrying the Virgin Mary, and the discovery of the lead books, all to satirize the Spanish obsessions with racial purity and religious orthodoxy. Race and the Morisco problem are again present at the end of Don Quixote Part Two, but the definitive cure of Don Quixote's insanity is also fundamental. This cure involves a turn away from the chivalric genre toward the pastoral, an encounter with a character from Avellaneda's apocryphal continuation, and most importantly, deep attention to mundane matters like Sancho's salary and Don Quixote's last will and testament. Oh, and there will be some final meta-literary playfulness here as well. Chapter 71 remains one of Cervantes' most spectacular meditations on the material basis of human relations and what this has to do with art. The initial focus is compensation for work, specifically Sancho's miraculous power to disenchant and resuscitate the dead. While Don Quixote is saddened by his military defeat, he takes solace in his squire's ability. His sadness was caused by his defeat and his happiness by considering the virtue of Sancho as he had revealed it through the resurrection of Altisidora. By contrast, Sancho remains saddened by his lack of compensation because he was saddened to see that Altisidora had not kept her word in giving him the shirts. The squire portrays himself as an unpaid doctor I am the most disgraced doctor that could be found in the world, where a physician, upon killing the patient for whom he is caring, wishes to be paid for his work, which consists of no more than signing a prescription for some medicines, which not he but the apothecary makes, and that's that. Yet I, who must pay for another's health with drops of blood, chin slaps, pinches, pinpricks, and lashes, am not given a farthing. Sancho's complaint leads to a final salary negotiation between Squire and Hidalgo. Don Quixote agrees that Altisidora acted wrongly. Altisidora has done very wrong by not giving you the promised shirts. Did you know, along with lawyers, doctors were viewed poorly during the Renaissance. Antonio de Guevara regrets the existence of these two categories of men in his Menosprecio de Corte y Alabanza de Aldea. Valladolid, 1539. He then offers to pay Sancho for the disenchantment of Dulcinea. For my part, I can tell you that if you wanted to be paid for the disenchantment of Dulcinea, then I would have considered it money well spent. Flog yourself, then, and pay yourself a going rate and by your own hand, for you are carrying my money. It's an amazing moment. The narrator underscores this by telling us that Sancho's inner motivations transform completely. Sancho opened his eyes and ears a full span, and in his heart, he consented happily to flog himself. Now for the salary negotiation. Sancho begins, tell me, your grace, how much you will give me for each lash. Metaphorically speaking, Don Quixote brings the entire Spanish empire into play, although he leaves the first bid up to his squire. If I had to pay you, Sancho, given what this remedy of such greatness and quality deserves, neither the treasures of Venice nor the mines of Potosí would be enough. Take measure of what you have of mine there and put a price on each lash. 
Sancho's calculation is miraculous. He may be an ignorant peasant who repeatedly states that he cannot read, but he sure knows math when it comes to getting paid for his lashes. Let's consider the 3,000 and 300, which at a quarter each, for I will not accept less even if the whole world orders me to, amount to 3,000 and 300 quarters. And those 3,000 make 1,500 half reales, which makes 750 reales. And the 300 come to 150 half reales, which make 75 reales, which together with the 750 make for a total of 825 reales. Don Quixote is amazed by this transformation. Oh, blessed Sancho, oh, kind Sancho, and even offers him an incentive. And consider Sancho when you want to start your flogging. If you do it soon, I'll add another 100 reales. Our Hidalgo believes he is on the brink of turning his own defeat into a most glorious triumph. Quixotic Mission How much does Sancho calculate he will earn by whipping himself for Don Quixote and Dulcinea? A. 825 reales B. 3,300 reales C. 1,000 reales Correct answer A. 825 reales. Once again, Cervantes confronts readers with the ultimate lesson of replacing force and coercion with pay for services. In other words, the bourgeois ideal, which we have been pondering ever since Don Quixote's first sally, when he encountered the prostitutes from Seville, the first innkeeper, Andres Enaldudo, and the merchants of Toledo. But notice the figurative maneuver here. Sancho is now in the position of dehumanized victims like Andres and the slaves of Micomicon, except for one important difference. He will be paid for his lashes. Notice also that the squire's lashes relate explicitly to the theme of Apuleius's ass, making a powerful and flexible whip out of the ass's halter and bridle he retired some 20 paces from his master among some beech trees. Finally, notice that the miracle of Sancho's lashes leads to Don Quixote's moral transformation as well. Our Hidalgo expresses great interest in his squire's well-being for a change. Look, friend, don't tear yourself to shreds. And he counts Sancho's lashes in a way that recalls the symbolic rosary of galley slaves freed in chapter 22 of part one, as well as the scatological rosary used for his own penance in part one, chapter 26. I will stand to one side counting the lashes you give yourself with my rosary here. That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in our next discussion of this fascinating text. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.